It's Friday Feedback Friday, the feedback day of the week. Ha! <coughs> Sorry, guys. Little coffee today. Strained my voice. I've tried to do way, way too much this week. But as expected, there was more on the Battlefront 2 scandal. Um, but first, I want to do a few comments, actual comments. Look at them. Um... One is somebody pointing out, I, I totally butchered my point on this. Uh, the commenter is right that uh, Ubisoft is publicly traded. It's a complicated thing where they, Ubisoft has a minority, has a majority stake, but they are a publicly traded company. I completely botched my explanation of that, and I apologize. They are right. They also say the company is pronounced Ubisoft, not Ubisoft. I am not going to be able to get away from saying Ubisoft. I have non canadian my pronunciation of Mario, as in Super Mario. I will not be able to do it with Ubisoft, because all the French-Canadian developers up here say Ubisoft. They don't say Ubisoft. It's, it's just uh, the accent. It's the same way we say Poutine instead of Poutine, and Quebec instead of Quebec. We're a bilingual country, and it impacts the English pronunciation of words sometimes. Um, but uh, Troy Levitt who, as he points out, is, uh, you guys have seen the interview I did with him, uh, the back and forth we've had. He leaves a great comment about the business model at Disney and how that negatively impacted games. And I wanted to share this because I, he explains it better than I can. What he basically said is all of the game studios I've, I've mentioned, and you can read the whole comment, um, we're all required to carry very high overhead costs from the parent company, including inventory, legal, marketing, executive staff, and even back charging from other Disney divisions. For example, when working on Disney Infinity, any time we spent working with Marvel, Lucasfilm, or Pixar was all back charged against the studio. This business model makes it difficult for the game development studios to look profitable even when their revenues are high. Disney Infinity earns somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion dollars in revenue across its three incarnations. But even so, the profit margins were low because of all the inventory overhead costs. And this, this is the thing that drives me crazy about these multi-million dollar productions is the, the creative accounting in Hollywood is notorious. You guys may have seen the studio that... Um, George Miller had to sue the Mad Max uh, production uh, company because they claimed the film wasn't profitable or something like that. It's so crazy, the creative accounting. And what I think Disney failed with Infinity, in, in, uh, especially Infinity, less so with, with Epic Mickey, um, which was a great idea not well executed and it pains me to say that because i really liked elements of the game but overall it was a bit of a hot mess um or something like split second um the uh the thing about disney infinity is it was a crazy good marketing tool for their various properties it, and and they could say well Battlefront 2 is marketing as well. It's not the same way though, because maintaining a high level of quality on your brand extensions is really, really important. And I think it's extra important in the realm of interactive entertainment because the, um, the audience is so discerning. It's not even audience, the consumer base, because they're players, not an audience, right? People will be more forgiving of a bad movie because it's only, you know, 12 bucks and two-ish, two to three hours of your life. When a game's bad, you've spent a lot more money with that than that and wasted a lot more time. Um, I, I get why Disney does these back charges. It's so they can make other areas look profitable. So they're propping up some areas which are much more volatile. Film is always volatile because one movie bombs. Uh, you know, we saw it just recently with Disney. Cars 3 didn't set the world on fire and it, it pulled all the earnings stuff down. But this, this has been a complaint of mine in these big studios. 
uh, for quite some time with gaming, I thought that when EA acquired all these little companies, they were going to use that to create more of a, um, a mutually beneficial arrangement between people with great game engines and people with great writers and, and things like that. And really, everybody helps everybody. Silly me. You know, that is the way Ubi or Yubi uh, deals with the stuff. The, each studio sort of has a um, specialty, but certain ones will take point, uh, whereas others will provide assistance. Uh, it, it works mostly well. I understand Assassin's Creed Origins was kind of buggy, but it seems that this holiday has been one for disasters. But it's really disappointing. Troy knows I love him if he's listening. He knows I love uh, I love his work. Um, and, and I, you know, <laughs> this may sound totally biased, but it's so weird because he worked on a lot of my favorite Disney Infinity playsets. I really liked the Lone Ranger playset. I know people thought the movie wasn't good, but I found the, the playset really fun. I really liked the Inside Out playset. I haven't played Finding Dory. Um, I've been hiding my Disney Infinity figurines because the dog chewed my special edition green goblin. And I was like, no, you are not getting my Stitch figurine. My poor green goblin has a nod head right now. But, uh, I, I really like what Disney Infinity did. I really like what it tried to do. Um, I like that it provided, um, greater complexity of gameplay than Skylanders did. And hey, I loved my Skylanders at first too, uh, the minute they brought in cars, I was like, this is too much crap <laughs> stored in plastic bins. But um, I, I really like the Toys to Life thing. I think it got oversaturated, but that was because all the companies, you know, the parent companies went money and just ruined a good thing. Uh, but I I stand by because I, I do respect the the work that, that Troy and, and the Avalanche studio employees did. Um, you saw with Disney Infinity, a big improvement in the quality of the tie-ins with films because those game tie-ins to films are very difficult because you have a shortened development period, you don't get access to a lot of stuff. It's And, and you remember when those games were just shovelware, there'd be this crappy game that came out, especially back in the PS2 days, or the, you know, the, the Nintendo, uh, oh, which was it? The Super Nintendo or the GameCube or something like that. The 64, the 64, I'm sorry. And um, it was like these crappy shovelware games would come out as tie-ins. I remember a Madagascar game that was just awful. I know that's not Disney, but um, they were just shoveled out and they weren't very good. But it was like, hey, remind people the movie's out. When... Disney Infinity became a thing and they could create the figures and put them in the game or make a little playset for Frozen or make a little playset for Inside Out. Instead of having to build a game from start to finish, the quality of those extensions went way, way up because they could do interesting things with what they had in, instead of having to fart around with, and I got a Notification for a Kickstarter game I'm backing. Wow. Uh, but uh, they they could really concentrate on a really cool little six-hour experience instead of having to make a whole game that was just kind of crappy. And I much preferred it. And as much as I try to understand the, the business stuff with why companies like Disney make these decisions, at the end of the day, I'm a gamer. I just want great games. And... The quality of the product that we saw in in Disney Infinity, I would even say Epic Mickey, despite my criticisms about it, are vastly above this Battlefront 2 crap. And that's why I want to switch over. You'll notice it's an article from the delightful, delightful Eric Kane. It's, a, it's, it's friend week on this YouTube channel. I, I really like Eric. I respect his opinions a lot. Uh, but... Uh, and this is where most people go, even though we don't agree on everything, but you guys know I don't do that. So, <laughs> the plot thickens on this EA thing. Wow. 
One commenter pointed out that apparently the game lowers the cap to buy Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, but it also lowers how quickly XP is paid out by the game. So there's not that much change. I can't confirm that. I am not going to buy this game. So I'm just letting you guys know a commenter said that. But it turns out that the EA developer, and this is crazy week because the story was broken by Kotaku, which is one of those websites that people kind of turn their head and spit if you're a gamer and you say the name Kotaku. But Kotaku broke this story. Kudos to Kotaku. This is good journalism. The EA developer on Twitter who claimed that he'd gotten seven death threats and 600 personal attacks uh, isn't an EA developer. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um. <laughs> What the hell? This is what happens with these things. It credibility is so important in those in these stories cuz in part because of the way Twitter works. This drove me crazy. On on Twitter you may have been following the Senate hearings as well that when Twitter uh, deletes an account or or suspends an account, the data is basically gone. Like it's wiped out. If an account's deleted, it's all gone. And so there were certain situations where people wanted me to prove harassment and I couldn't because the other thing people would do is send me messages and then block me. And of course, then I lose access to the account that was blocked, meaning I lose access to the, the harassing tweets. And I eventually went, came to the point that Eric did in this piece that... Um, you know, where did he say, uh, a bad monetization system in a game is no reason to harass game developers or issue death threats. Just like me writing scathing reviews of The Walking Dead is no reason for me to see, receive harassments or death threats. But hey, it happens. I get loads of it over numerous subjects. And according to these tweets, so did this developer. Turns out the developer wasn't a developer on the game. But you know, my attitude about harassment became, well, if guys like Eric Kane have to put up with this crap, well, this is the job and I am not going to play harassment bingo um i just ignore it or in the cases of horrendous spelling <laughs> i laugh at it um like i did and i was like i shouldn't i shouldn't share trolling i shouldn't share mean comments but this one was just so funny uh someone called me a fucking whore but spelled whore H-O-R-E, and it led to some very funny conversations on Twitter because I said that I think he just hit enter in the middle of writing by the hoary host of Hogarth uh, from, from Doctor Strange. Um, uh, somebody started talking about Horfrost and <laughs> it just went from there. It was really, really funny. Um, and that's why I don't like when people are going, I'm getting death threats. I mean... I think it should sort of be uh, etiquette in gaming that if you have a problem with a game, complain to the official account, complain to the marketing account at EA. I say this in part because developers don't have the power. People think they do. Um, the developer is probably aware there is an issue, but, but you know, tweet the Call of Duty account, for instance, or the, the uh, Battlefront account don't tweet the individual developers especially if they're kind of lower on the totem pole i think some of the creative directors and design di directors and things like that they're um they're kind of higher up they're more prepared to take it but if somebody just worked on you know the the art on a game don't seriously like don't bother complaining to them about something in a game or a statement they made on behalf of the company, complain to the company because they're the one that ultimately uh, hires and fires and, and decides what decisions are allowed to be made. The, the shit rolls downhill. And one of my big concerns about all of these scandals in gaming is that the 
developers eat a lot of crap for stuff that wasn't their call. A lot of times developers have particular things forced on them. They're told they must do this by the money guys because they have to make so and so much profits. And uh, unfortunately, microtransactions have become part of the landscape. I hate them. Um, you know, my, my hates in, in gaming are one, overly complicated game controls. By that I mean three buttons mapped to do what one button could do. Um, then the fucking dialogue wheel in Mass Effect and Dragon Age. You guys know I hate that. The Sims. Yeah, I hate the dialogue wheel more than The Sims. Um, and then microtransactions. I really, really dislike microtransactions. And people have pointed out that my hatred of the dialogue wheel, my hatred of microtransactions, and my hatred of The Sims are all EA things. <laughs> EA isn't... <laughs> microtransactions aren't exclusive to EA. EA does them uniquely badly. They don't think... Um, they don't really think it through and find a way to make it cool. Um, I was trying to think of microtransactions bordering on DLC that I'm okay with. Uh, I realized that, for instance, in a fighting game, if there's a massive roster of characters, I'll pick one that I like, Mortal Kombat, for instance. The whole idea around designing fighting games is that they're spreading out the time between launches of a game, but having more extended content for the game. And it makes sense. If you've got a really functional battle system, it makes sense to just roll out, you know, new little bits of campaign or new characters or this, that, and the next thing so that, you know, but, but if the combat system at its core is, is balanced and makes sense, don't break it. I am totally good with telling your main story with a core, a core set of characters and then allowing people to purchase other characters provided they do not break the game. They, they don't unbalance the game to a point. I don't like it when you have a thing like, you know, Goro grayed out in Mortal, Com Mortal Kombat. The game you buy should feel complete. And as I said, you know, on, in Wednesday's video, I should be able to buy what I want. If I am putting down real money in something, I should be able to buy the item I want, not just a damn lottery ticket. You know, the that gotcha system, um, the random loot crate system, is something that has been stolen from mobile games. And the thing about mobile games People don't pay a purchasing fee for something like Candy Crush Saga or the one I play, which is, um, I play, I used to play Pet Rescue, not so much anymore. I play Gardenscapes and I play Homescapes, uh, which are the same company. One is like, you tend this garden in this big mansion. Another is the butler from that game. And anyway, it doesn't matter. You guys don't care. But, um, they're just little match three things. I play them when I go to sleep because, um, it stops me from... <laughs> Going over and over the song lyrics that got stuck in my head that day because of the random match three. It's just enough concentration without an adrenaline spike. So it helps me sleep. Um, but there is no requirement. I kind of hit the point with these games. I know I did this with Pet Rescue Saga. If I hit level 500 in a game, I will give them five bucks. Because I want developers who make games I like to keep making games. But you don't have to put money into that game. Um, there's no extra stuff. It's just little credits so you can do things in game. I mean, I remember on, uh, Farmville, I was obsessed with the sheep. And sometimes I bought a little holiday sheep because I thought they were really cute. But I was under no, uh, illusions what I was doing. I was putting money into the game because I recognized, hey, I'd put all this time and enjoyment into building my little farm because it was like this little zen garden. They deserve to get some money. I was not putting money in because it took so damn long to unlock something that I got frustrated and jumped the line. That just, the idea of being able to jump the line just really offends uh, the gamer sentiment, which is all based on sort of get good. And 
you have these objects as bragging rights. You know, there were certain items in World of Warcraft where those were big deals, even though they were ugly as fuck, because, wow, you had to be really, you had to put in a lot of time, be really good, you know, be part of the, the most elite raids to get those items. And, or in sometimes you rooked one of your friends into playing paid for six months, like somebody did for me, so that they could get the stupid Zebra mount. I knew it was stupid, but they really, really wanted the mount. So Blizzard got six months of WoW from me because of this. Um, but uh, this, I mean, obviously this is back a ways because it was subscription. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, uh, there are ways of doing in-app purchases that don't offend the player. And I really think that EA's problem is not that it has in-app purchases or microtransactions. There are a lot of games that do. It's that they are invasive. It's that they just seem to be shoehorned in. And that's the problem. And that is a problem with a company that very much has a business model and we go back to the business model the same way we did with the, the comment Troy left. They've got a, a business model that is all quarter to quarter. You know, you have to show steady, you know, balance sheet profits through creative accounting and then, you know, swindling your consumers. Isn't that a great word, swindling? But... They have to be steady so games are pushed out before they're ready because they have to hit that launch because it'll affect that sales quarter. And they do all this stuff that makes people play pay more money than they normally would for a game. And personally, I think if games are really as expensive as they claim, if it the margins are so low and game developers just need more money, I would be quite happy going back to, you know, that those halcyon days of yore where a main campaign was 18 hours long. And that's it. And it was a complete experience. And if you wanted more, if you want more than that, you can pay to unlock more than that, but at least you're getting the base. I personally prefer new content. I want more story. You guys know I really liked the uh, Horizon Zero Dawn DLC because within five minutes of, of starting to play that, it was, oh, oh, more information on a character I really like. That is catnip for me. It feels meaningful. Um, because now, multiplayer used to be this feature that was added value for this game so that the Call of Duty campaign could be only six hours long, but then people pay, play hours and hours and hours in multiplayer. Um, then everything had to have multiplayer in it. And it was crappy multiplayer because they just had to have it in even though it didn't make sense. If people want to spend... Ex if people want to play multiplayer, if that's their big thing, why not have a reasonable fee for multiplayer. I'm not saying 50 bucks, that's too much. 10 bucks, 10 bucks a year to play multiplayer. It's a reasonable amount of money. People who play multiplayer are gonna spend a lot more hours in the game than somebody who just plays single player. And it, you know, it should be, you get the first 10 hours of multiplayer free, and then if you want more than that, you can, you can pay your 10 bucks. But I think it's more the cost of these seasons passes that are prohibitive for people because, you know, someone like me who plays a lot of games, I can't put down all that money for a season's pass because it's the cost of another game. And I'm more interested in going in and seeing how these games work and really having an interesting experience. And I like single player uh, for various reasons. One is which I have a lot of cats and so I'm hitting pause a lot. <laughs> I am the worst person to play multiplayer with because I do not have three hour chunks of time. Uh, 
But I, I think, and I could be completely wrong, and, and that's fine. I don't have to make these decisions. The point is I'm thinking about another monetization model that's trying to solve these issues of, well, games are getting more expensive to produce, and there's no price tolerance for a price increase on the main, the main purchase price. But gamers are rightly annoyed by this system that they have to pay money for essentially digital lottery tickets. That's nonsense, you know, this ridiculous, and the paying to jump the line. I guess, I mean, Mortal Kombat did that and I just didn't use it at all. I didn't care enough about the perks to, uh, to engage with that. But, the, and maybe, you know, the fans, the fan bases for different games would be different. In some fan bases, it works a lot better. In others, not so much. I just go back to the thing, and a lot of you guys agreed with me, about you can't fuck up Star Wars. You can't. That's just one that you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. Um, because it's so beyond a video game. And I, just, I don't know, I just think Disney of all companies, you know, this is the company that spent how many decades in legal, legal battles getting Oswald the Rabbit back? I, I really thought Disney understood IP better than this, even if they don't understand games so well. And that's why this is disappointing. The bad experience somebody has with Battlefront, the anger for that, is going to translate to a general exhaustion with all things Star Wars. We're having to get used to this new cast, and we're having to get used to stormtroopers that look different, or imperial troopers, whatever the fuck they're called right now. But uh, we're having to get used to a whole lot of new stuff. They really have to bring it with episode eight, but that's a discussion for another time. They also have to make sure that every extended experience they have with a Star Wars experience is of the same quality as we expect from those films. And I know I just said quality and everybody remembers Star Wars episode one, which was terrible, but that was the whole problem. It was terrible. Right? We all went back and watched 4, 5, and 6. And it's funny because little kids liked episodes 1, 2, and 3. So fine. But nobody likes feeling like they're being squeezed for cash. Right? Right. Okay. I rambled a bit at the end there. Um, I get to stop because my throat is really hurting me. Thanks for watching. Happy weekend.